And joining us now on the debate, Don Drummond, former chief economist to the TD Bank Financial Group, now the Matthews Fellow in Global Policy at Queen's University. Gary Lipinski, president of the Métis Nation of Ontario. Brenda Small, dean of the Naganiwin College of Academic and Community Development at Confederation College in Thunder Bay. And Mimi Gelman, PhD student in cultural studies at Queen's University. Welcome, everybody. And I, I, let's clarify right off the top, because I've made a faux pas already. We are talking about post-secondary opportunities and improving the situation for Aboriginal Canadians, which means First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, Inuit. And Inuit students as well, yes. Great. Yes. And, and, and by using the word Aboriginal Canadian, that includes all of, that includes First Nations, Métis, right. Inuit. Yes. Good. Thank you, Doc. Okay. Because we, we should do this right. I'm going to start with a series of charts here because I'm going to share with our audience that which you all know extremely well, uh, but which many of our viewers may not know. So, Michael, if we can, let's start telling the story here of the way things are. Here's the population growth in Canada by percentage. You see the last half of the last decade of the 20th century, where Aboriginal population, the bar to the right in blue, is significantly higher than the non-Aboriginal population, and it hasn't changed much in the first half of the first decade of the 21st century. And incidentally, the average age in the 206 census, Aboriginal population 26 and a half years old, non-Aboriginal population almost 40. So growing quickly and much younger. Keep that in mind. Second chart, unemployment rates in Canada. No surprise here. Again, if you look at the years from 96 to 201 to 206, even though that blue graph is coming down, that blue bar, it is still significantly higher unemployment in the Aboriginal population than the non-Aboriginal population. Let's do one more. Education rates achieved. This is percentage of the population aged 20 to 24 with a degree. And whether you are talking high school or trades or college or university, non-Aboriginals are graduating at much higher rates than First Nations off the reserve, First Nations on reserve. This paints a bleak, bleak picture. Don, the numbers tell an obvious story. They tell a bigger story as well. What's the bigger story that's also emerging from these numbers? Well, I, I look at it as two stories. Uh, the first one is uh, what's happening with Aboriginal people in Canada. Obviously, that's not an acceptable picture. It's a sad, pathetic story, and it's been going on for a long time. They have lower labor force participation, lower employment, dramatically lower incomes. But there's a bigger story. Uh, you, one should be concerned about it for the sake of the Aboriginal people, but there's a national story here as well. As the population chart showed, and we could do that in terms of the labor force as well, that is the growth of Canada's labor force, potentially, over mm -hmm. the future. It's not coming from the non-Aboriginal population. And because of the age, that median age is at just getting into the labor force. So this is going to be our labor force growth going forward. If we continue with that kind of employment record, it's not going to be very good for the national economy, never mind just for the Aboriginal people. And here's the great irony. You can't talk to an employer in Canada, even as we're just coming out of the recession, without saying we have this great shortage of skilled workers and we're all lamenting what's going to happen by 2020. We do have a potential pool of labor. It is there. It's right there in those population. But we got the demand for labor over here, and we got this potential supply. We got to bring them together. And of course, one of the factors is why we're talking about it that stops those two coming together is education. And let's put a bar graph up. One more. One more bar graph now, just to show what you're talking about here. Here's employment by education level. Watch what happens as Aboriginal Canadians get an education. If you have less than high school, your chances of getting a job, not great if you're an Aboriginal Canadian. If you get a high school diploma, it's a little closer to the national average. If you get a college diploma, it's a little closer to the national average. But look at those last two bar graphs. If you have a university diploma, university degree, I guess, you are equally as likely, whether you are non-Aboriginal or Aboriginal, to get a job in this country. These are all stats can numbers, incidentally. OK, Brenda, you work in this field. So tell us, why does the bachelor's degree seem to be the great equalizer in all of Canada? I think it's clear that education, formal education, and graduating is really critical to one's own autonomy, one's ability to take care of oneself. And so for a lot of our students, it's really important that they graduate. That's very, very important for the family. Gary, what do you say on that? Well, I think, um, you know, I think it would be no sur surprise to all Canadians uh, recognizing that you know, higher education, whether it's uh, college degrees or university degrees, you know, gets you into those higher paying jobs. 
And what I think is an important factor for uh, all Canadians to realize in this as well is that it's intergenerational impacts. So the investments made today to get the people into good, good paying, good, good, good quality jobs based on higher education, you know, it means that that particular individual, his family will have opportunities available to them. They'll probably, you know, health, health determinants will go down, they'll live in better housing, uh, uh, a better way of life. Uh, and those opportunities will be likewise passed on to their children. So you're talking about intergenerational positive effects. Uh, investing in those opportunities now will, uh, will be place uh, Aboriginal students well, well to where they need to be in the future. Now, Mimi, before I ask you the first question, if you thought Gary Lipinski didn't sound like an Aboriginal <laughs> name, Mimi Gelman really doesn't sound like an Aboriginal name. Well. But are you? Uh, I am indeed. And uh, I'm, go I'm going to first uh, begin by honoring the Mississaugas of, of the uh, New Credit First Nations, the territory that we are sitting on at present, and introduce myself as uh, Mimi Gelman Nimki Kwe Ndishnikaz, Toronto, Shigo, Rat River Settlement, and Dongji, Wabajaje Bikido Dem, Anishinaabe Kwe Ndao. And what I've said is that my name is Mimi Gelman. Uh, I am a Jewish Métis Anishinaabe Kwe, Anishinaabe woman. My people come from Red River Settlement, Manitoba, and Slonim, Russia. So I have an Ojibwe Métis mom, I have a Jewish dad, and obviously from the color of my skin, I'm racialized as white. What language were you just speaking? I was speaking Anishinaabe Mawin, which is Ojibwe. Okay. I've never met anybody like you before in my life. That is quite a mix. Well, just let me say that there are a profound number of Jewish natives in Canada and the States. It seems to be a very popular mix. Hmm. So, Okay, having said all that, the dropout rates we saw on that bar graph there is that as, you know, as you get to a university education, it's a great leveler. But the left side of that graph was pretty terrible. If you're Aboriginal and you drop out, there's a huge discrepancy between that and uh, non-Aboriginals uh, dropping out. Uh, why? Why such a disparity on that left side of the chart? Well, I think that there are a lot of reasons, and I think one of the one of the 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 big the big reason is that uh, Aboriginal students are going into an educational system that is still still being largely affected by um, uh, colonial practices and uh, and ways of knowing. In 2011. In 2011, we have had, in, since the 60s, we have had an extraordinary surge in Aboriginal scholarship. We have had um, uh, new curriculums, in, certainly in Ontario, that uh, mandate that uh, Aboriginal ways of knowing and history should be in the curriculum. But there is a fabulous um, uh, study that's being done in an Ontario university to see what secondary school students, university and college students know about Aboriginal peoples, and it has not increased since the 60s. They don't know about the Indian Act, they don't know about Aboriginal ways of knowing, they don't know about the white paper, they don't know that we're all treaty people. Okay, Steve, can, Gary, yes, please. Can I just add, you know, I think, um, you know, those statistics as, as they're presented are alarming enough, and, um, and no doubt they're pulled from, you know, recent uh, Canadian census st statistics, and. Hopefully, we'll still have reliable data to go on in the future, but I know that's another story for another time. <laughs> but, but the point I want to make on this is that in many cases, we don't have reliable data to, to draw on, uh, which could even be higher numbers. For instance, um, within, within the education system, uh, K-12, up until very recently in Ontario, there was no uh, identification of, um, of Métis students whatsoever. Um, and the only way First Nations students were identified is if they had tuition agreements with the First Nations bands uh, with the boards, and so even so, you could have First Nations living um, in, a, in an off reserve, um, and if they weren't subject to a tuition agreement, they wouldn't be identified, and no Métis students were identified. So we don't really know; uh, those numbers could be a lot higher because it's only picked up through census, like how many students are actually dropping out. Understood. Well, let's see if we can get a better sense of it. You, you work on a post-secondary campus. Give us yes. a sense of what the typical Aboriginal student goes through. Well, I think that for a lot of students coming from the north, there's a huge transition they need to make when they make a move to a city. And further to that, there's a whole question of will they find a proper place to live? Will they be able to get the support they need to do well academically? And for a lot of students, that's not always possible. So their success rate is compounded by those various factors that mean that they're not going to be successful all the time. Let me ask you a little more about that transition, Brenda, because if you come from Sault Ste. Marie, 
or North Bay or Timmins, and you plunk yourself down in the downtown campus of the University of Toronto, that's going to be a bit of a culture shock. How much more so if you come from a reserve where 100 people live you know, in a very remote part of northern Ontario? I think for a lot of students who are coming from the far north, there's definitely a huge adjustment because they're coming to a place that they don't know, they don't know anyone. They don't have any prior experience in large centers or in going to large formal educational institutions. That makes it very, very difficult for Where them. Where are you from originally? I grew up in Moose Factory, Ontario. Moose Factory. How yeah. many thousands of kilometers is that north of where we are right now? It's, it's a long way. It is a long way. And you went from there to? Sault Ste. Marie. To? High school and at you, uh, you age 14. But I was very fortunate. My parents actually moved with my brother and I, so we had that family support. Did you end up at U of T, though? You I did. did. You yes. did law at U of T? Yes, I did. I graduated in 1992. From Moose Factory to U of T Law. Right. That is some transition, ma'am. It is. It is huge. Uh, in retrospect, I, I think because we encountered a lot of those changes as a family, it made a huge difference in terms of the ability to do that. But Steve, that's a good introduction to a deal with something that's potentially misleading in the numbers that we just looked at. So it, it gives you on the surface a picture if you're Aboriginal, have a bachelor's, everything's equal to the situation if you're a non-Aboriginal bachelor, and I would argue that's not the case. As you just heard this kind of experience, the Aboriginal student who goes through a bachelor has overcome a lot more obstacles than other people, and I would probably, everything else equal, should probably be earning more because they may be smarter, but they're certainly more determined and certainly persevered and often want more. And then maybe just decipher between three different levels of education. So one rather surprising statistic is amongst the Aboriginal population who does have a grade 12, they're just as likely as a non-Aboriginal to go on to some form of post-second education. So first of all, that emphasizes the importance of getting that grade 12. Right. But secondly, they're much more likely to go to college than university. The participation rate, Aboriginal versus non-Aboriginal, is fairly similar in colleges. It's only about one-third amongst the Aboriginal and universities. There are a number of reasons that colleges are obviously less expensive. Geographically, they tend to be cl located closer to the Aboriginal population. They're more directly related to employment prospects at the end. They don't tend to have the same type of uh, interest requirements, and that, that comes back to grade 12. And the Aboriginal student may graduate from grade 12, but are they getting a 92% average, which is necessary to get into a lot of the universities in Canada? Probably not, certainly not in math and sciences. Mimi, does it take more for an Aboriginal student to get through a three or four year degree than it does for a non-Aboriginal? It absolutely does. It does. And huh? it does because you're, they're facing um, this idea of a free myth, the, uh, of a free ride, the myth of a free ride. So they got what, in what somehow. Well, they got in somehow through the back door. They didn't have the same kind, didn't have to meet the same kind of requirements. Oh, the, their band pays for them. They don't have the same financial difficulties as mm -hmm. most students. Um, they face incipient racism on campus because there is not an understanding of indigenous ways of knowing and where they've come from. Sometimes it's a question of language. Someone who grew up as a Cree speaker comes into the university and may not, may, may be a beautifully eloquent um, uh, Cree speaker, but is not is not uh, uh, articulating in the same way in English. Um, you have uh, um, also the uh, the barriers of being silenced uh, in a class, and you have the sorry, stop there. The barriers of being, being silenced? silenced, silenced, and what I mean by that is there is a lot of unspoken shame in our country. Uh, in regards to what has happened to our people, and that is not spoken. And so when someone starts to speak in a class about indigenous methodologies or ways of being, there's a, there's a direct, immediate react, reaction and response, which I'm saying comes from shame. Okay, let me pick up on the top of what you said with Gary. The, 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 this, I think you call it the myth of the free ride or something right. like that. Let's get that straight. Do, do Aboriginal Canadians have to pay for their own post-secondary education tuition? Well, I think, you know, we're obviously, uh, we're talking about a, a broad ranging problems. When we're using the right. term Aboriginal, uh, you know, I think we need, when we look at the, the problems associated within that, you need to break it down into subgroups and even within the regions of those subgroups. So, for instance, um, certainly some First Nations students get funding from the Department of Indian Affairs for some of their post-secondary education. I know the First Nations leadership has been very um, vocal in the fact that that's inadequate funding and there hasn't been... Uh, uh, it's, it, the funding's been frozen for a number of years and the band is greater and so there's huge issues around that level of funding. But again, part of this myth or misconception is first, Métis students get nothing. 
There is no funding for Métis students for post-secondary education except for whatever their parents might save, whatever they can get through scholarships and bursaries, or whatever so they can get through summer student. There what is everybody no else gets, in other words. Right. Exactly. And, uh, and their parents are paying taxes as well as everybody else and, you know, trying to earn, meek out the living as, as well as everybody else. And I think, uh, you know, the, the panel is touching on some important barriers that need to be highlighted. In many cases, you're talking about uh, Aboriginal students having to travel very significant distances um, to get into those institutions, post-secondary institutions. And so that adds, adds huge burdens, financial burdens that, again, many others wouldn't have. It's one thing to drive two and four hours, say, from Toronto to Kingston or whatever to visit your family on a weekend. You can't do that if you're from a, a more, more northern or remote community. You're lucky to get home for the Christmas break or whatever. Right. And so you're talking about large extended periods away from your family. Brenda was very fortunate uh, to have her family move with her, and I, you know, that would be a huge support. When you take away those supports, you add the increased financial burden, and we're going completely out of your environment where uh, typically in more than northern communities people are in touch with their, with their communities, uh, hunting and fishing and being outdoors would be a part of their natural environment. You move to an area where you're completely isolated from all of that. All of those factors have to be considered into it. Brenda, See, what, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, we have a bit of a paradox as well because the Aboriginal population is younger, as your data showed, but mm -hmm. the students are somewhat older. Mm -hmm. And it comes back to the challenges of grade 12. Many of them did not get grade 12 at the age that we did. They were 16 or 17, and they've gone back. Well, when you're an older student, you're more likely to have some family responsibilities. So you quite often have an overall financial need. Mm -hmm. And it's just really subtle things that run through the systems as well. For example, if you're going to apply for a scholarship, you have to write an essay about yourself and presumably right that you're the greatest thing that's ever been created. Well, that's not in the culture. It's a culture of humbleness. And so you don't write great things about yourself, and then you look at, well, this person doesn't look worthy about it. But I just use it as one example of the kind of barriers that aren't obvious at the first instance. What uh, does your college name translate into? I work at uh, Naganawin College, and um, Naganawin is an Ojibwe word that means leading the way leading the way. I, I don't doubt that your institution is leading the way, but I also don't doubt that, that there are lots of post-secondary institutions in Ontario where Aboriginal Canadians don't feel that welcome. Or do, the, the system is not yet kind of, as, as Don was just saying, figured out how to deal with them in, a, in the distinctive way that would be required. Is that fair to say? I would say that that's true. I think that there is a need for great uh, change to be made. And as a result, it's difficult for a lot of students to feel comfortable in the institutions that they go to. Do you think the institutions are trying to be more welcoming to First Nations, Métis, Inuit students? I would say that um, some of the institutions are doing better at that, yes. You want to name names? Well, we try. I know a lot of <laughs> colleges in Ontario also try. Okay, so Confederation so, College and Thunder Bay is doing a good job, but who else is doing a good job? In the college system, I would say that uh, a lot of the northern colleges, the uh, Cambrian Canador, Northern College. Lakehead. Lakehead, Laurentian right. University. Well, Trent. Not just in here, I mean, University of Victoria, University of Saskatchewan, yeah, University of true. Manitoba, mm -hmm. Lakehead, Nipissing. Lethbridge. There, there are a, a number. On, and, and doing Ontario very novel was, things. Yeah, Ontario is a bit behind, though, I think, if mm -hmm. we compare ourselves to the West. Right. Right, but I, th I thought yeah, it's okay. interesting. I mean, uh, you can see that, well, we're very soon 30% of the school age population in Saskatchewan will be Aboriginal, so it's not surprising really. But, you know, University of Victoria, 10 years ago, had 10 Aboriginal students, 700 this year. So you can do something, but it takes a lot. I mean, for, for example, just a, a, a name university like Queen's, you do not recruit students. You sit there and thousands of students apply. Well, that's not going to happen. And you know, you've got a big decision to make because if you wait for the 92% graduates of grade 12 from the Aboriginal continent, you're going to have a, a fairly small number. But do you have to wait around or are you to try to do it? You're more flexible in your entrance requirements? Do you go back into the communities and try to redo the job that the K-12 educators aren't doing? So there's some tough decisions to be made. Steve, uh, from, from uh, a leadership perspective, somebody who, uh, who engages with, the, with institutions, you know, I, I can say that we have found a very receptive open door with a number of colleges and, and universities. We've created partnerships with Confederation College, uh, with Sioux College, uh, with the University of Ottawa. And I know I'm going to leave some out here, so I'm going to have some upset mm -hmm. people with me. But uh, uh, we have a relationship with Queen's University, uh, met with the president of Lakehead University, we're working on some unique initiatives uh, with Georgian Bay, uh, and the list goes on and on. Uh, uh, and, you know, 
very much so looking to work, see how we can work together to make those improvements where we both seek in common, get more students in, make sure they're successful while they're in there. Um, looking at opportunities of what type of training, if it's, if it's college, uh, you know, meets our needs as Métis people and opportunities coming forward. So from my perspective as a leader, I found uh, the educational institution very willing to partner with us, and I certainly think that's a part, an important step forward. Here's what I hope is a good question for a former Deputy Minister of Finance, which we happen to have at the table here, a guy who's worked on a budget or two in his day. We've just seen the federal and provincial budgets come out. There's not a lot of new money in there for post-secondary education. I know the Ontario government over the next several years wants to create 60,000 new spaces, and that's, I think the, the initial reviews on that have been pretty good. But the kind of investment that I think you folks are talking about at this table here is significantly bigger than much of what we have seen over the last many decades. You've made the case how this is a burgeoning part of the population. We're going to need more workers. We're going to need more employees, a larger labor force. And here's a group that is dying for education and educational opportunities. Is this system going to be able to accommodate all of those factors? Yes, it can, but here's the problem. We do not have a mechanism in Canada to have policy geared to the long term. It's all short term. What I do is counted as an expenditure today. I got a deficit problem and I can't do that. We have overwhelming evidence that if you invest a dollar in what we're talking about, and the younger the better, you will get many, many dollars back in return to that. But obviously if you invest in an Aboriginal child at the age of five, you're not going to get that back for a while. But you will get lower welfare payments, you will get much higher income taxes, it's going to come back. But we don't have a mechanism, we don't have a political, we have political cycles, you know, minority governments go day to day, but at best you're going four or five years. We don't have that mechanism, an example that would seem completely unrelated, but consider we got an increase in infrastructure spending in Canada only when we started to amortize it over the life of the asset. As soon as we fix the accounting, it, blo it blossoms. So we almost a need a counterpart so of that in here. So that it's, it's an investment, it's not an expenditure, but how do we get that mentality in place? Well, so, Mimi, what's the, uh, well, I what think, do we do? I, uh, well, you know, we, I think one of the things that, that sort of building on what Don said is that um, Indigenous ways of, of knowing look at seven generations, many, many ge generations forward. So imagine that we have, that we want to um, uh, do some, some, we want to rebuild our um, Aboriginal education, the, Abri the Indigenous Academy, and we've had 150 years of assimilation practices, the residential school that has tried to take down that. Mm -hmm. And so we need 150 years to build it. We need to think about things in terms of generations. Mimi, and no politician in the world thinks 150 <laughs> years ahead. They don't think five years well, ahead of time. I, I understand that. And so that's, so, wh so what do we do? What do we do? So we have to, we, we still have to push for that. I totally understand that we have a, a way of being in the world now, but we can't limit our fu the future of our children to what we've done in the past. Well, I think it's, you know, I just like to, for folks to remember that uh, there was a lot of work put into uh, to a particular, what I think is a, is a unique moment in Canadian history. Um, I, as well as a lot of other, thousands of people put 18 months of work into what ultimately led up to the Kelowna Court, um, where you had a former prime minister, and I think one of the rare moments in Canada, every, uh, every premier from every province, every territorial leader was there, every Aboriginal leader, First Nations, the Métis Nation, the Inuit leadership, service delivery organization uh, were there. Um, everyone, we had consensus in Canada about how to, to work towards solving this problem and it was a commitment of a $10 billion commitment. Uh, over this is by former Prime Minister Paul Martin. Former Prime Minister Paul Martin um, on this very issue. And so like, 18 months of work went into ultimately reaching that Kelowna Accord and it was a uh, a 10-year commitment. Uh, I think it was a 10. Was it a 10 billion dollar yes. commitment? Right. Harper government Which was at that time, which at one point, one GST point uh, in, a, in, a, in a time when the Canadian government had surpluses, um, so they couldn't. You know, so there was not this. Well, we're in a deficit situation. We can't afford it. It was. It had surplus. It was paying off down the debt. Um, and so again, you talk about priorities of the government. What did it do? It cancelled the Kelowna Accord um, and dropped the GST two points. One of those points in one year would have covered that commitment for 10 years and you had consensus by everyone across this country in every, in every leadership form how to work towards a 10-year plan to solve this very issue. And the work was done for eight, over 18-month period. Let me just make sure I understand the lesson. Is, is the lesson here you're saying it can be done? I'm, it's saying it can be done. It's, this is not something that people haven't been talking about for years. There's been study okay. after study after study. You know, uh, I, I remember going probably 12, 12 years ago to, I think it was in Royal Bank of Canada, put out the cost of doing nothing. 
and very much along the lines we're talking about here today. Again, look at the economic cost to this country by not investing um, in Aboriginal youth. It's, it's, people have been recognizing for over a decade now that if you invest in these opportunities, get the skills that they need to have, they're going to be in the workplace and Canada becomes a better country because of it. Let me read something here that was in the National Post a couple of months ago, and it was written by John Richards. Here we go. Michael, if you would. Aboriginal educators need to recognize the interrelationship of provincial and band-run schools. Currently, four out of five Aboriginal children attend provincial schools. For the past generation, Aboriginal policy has been viewed primarily from the perspective of treaty rights. It is time to acknowledge that treaties are not a panacea for Aboriginal education problems. Let's go around on that. Brenda, what do you think of that view? Well, I think that Aboriginal people live everywhere. Ordinarily, people don't see themselves as part of a treaty relationship. However, after the uh, Ipperwash inquiry, there was discussion about how we're all treaty holders. That, that mm -hmm. became common. So perhaps with that view, we need to think about how everyone is responsible for the issue of Aboriginal education across the whole country. Not only Aboriginal people to advocate for this, but everyone has to be concerned. But Mimi, I guess what I'm wondering is, is it time for Aboriginal Canadians to give up on the idea of running their own school system and let the provinces take it over? Um, I don't necessarily think that that's the answer. I think that a, um, I think it's about partnerships. I think, I think Aboriginal schools can put forward Aboriginal curriculum, Abor Aboriginal ways of knowing in conjunction with those kinds of teachings which will help uh, Aboriginal students get into the workforce, meet certain kind of criteria. What, but would, I, what yeah. would be the best outcome for the kids? For young Aboriginal Canadians, what would be the best outcome? It says here four out of five Aboriginal kids are already going to provincial schools. Would it be better for them just to let the provinces take it over? Uh, but you see, what it's not speaking about is the quality of those provincial schools that they're attending. That's and true. so there's a disparity if one looks at, you know, there are good schools all over the country, but if, we, if you look at the, the, the uh, kind of schools and the level of education that go on in a lot of the, um, the community and, and reserve schools, it's uh, unfortunately uh, um, often substandard. You got any thoughts on that, Gary? Well, I do. First of all, again, I, 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 again, I think you have to break that question down into a couple of different segments because there are different circumstances for different people. So I know for, you know, for First Nations, it is a huge issue in the sense that um, there are, through the treaty obligations, the federal government is committed to providing a, a good, decent education, as every other Ontario and Canadian uh, should be entitled to. And so there is a role for the federal government to be making sure they're living up to those obligations that, that were given to First Nations through their treaties and that there is a good school system in place on reserves for that. And First Nations leadership is, is absolutely right to be, to be pressing that issue. But for, well, for all of Métis students, we don't live on reserves. We're, we're, we are part of the, the larger community, larger fabric, and many uh, First Nations as well live off reserve, and so they are attending the, uh, the regular public school systems. And so for us, uh, the approach we've been taking within the Métis Nation of Ontario is to, um, well, we've, we've been take, working out in mu uh, multiple layers. We have, we've reached an agreement with the government of Ontario. Uh, they signed a frame agreement with them. The very first ministries to sign on was the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of College and Training University, and very much in line with what we're talking about here. What can we do? How can we work together to close the gaps, those disparities that exist? And so from that, we're now able to develop partnerships with school boards, and get in there, develop those relationships. Again, we all have the same goals in common. Uh, and so through working in partnerships, we all have the same objectives. We want to make sure that every student can achieve the best and highest level possible of education that they want. I, I, I think whether it's federal or provincial or run by the bands is not the issue. We need two things. We need quality of education and we need role models. Every group needs role models. I mean, you discussed in your program before the disappearance of males as teachers to K to 12. <laughs> Look at the male dropout rate. Look how few males are going on post-secondary. Same in this field. Wherever the school is, there are not very many Aboriginal teachers in Canada, so we need to improve that, whether they teach at federal or provincial. But it's dollars and cents as well. I mean, there's always been the suggestions. There was less funding for the band-run schools. It was always going around as an allegation. Yeah. The parliamentary budget officer was, look at that. Guess what he found? It's absolutely true. Yeah. It's been capped for decades now, and it's way less. 
And here's a great irony. The largest reserve in Canada is the Six Nations. The school is run by the federal government. Why? Dollars and cents. If there's a hole in the roof, the federal government fix it. If there's a hole in the roof, they've got to cancel the books, lay off teachers to fix it if they were running the funding themselves. So it's got nothing really to do with the desire to run it themselves. You can have the ideological debate as federal, but the dollars and cents don't support that kind of decision. But maybe do you think the, uh, you know, for lack of a better expression, do you think the non-Aboriginal school system needs to I was going to say be blown up, but you know what I'm saying here. They have to completely rethink the way they teach Aboriginal children in order that by the time the end of high school comes, they're really much better prepared to go on to post-secondary life. I, I think so, but I'd like to include that they need to teach non-Aboriginal students the same thing, which is an understanding of what it means to be Indigenous in this country. I think it's really interesting that you have all over the world you have researchers and people who are studying native peoples in, in North America but we have very few native studies programs here you could go to Germany they have a better curriculum about North American natives than we have in Canadian school systems what is that saying just a few minutes to go here and Brenda let me try this with you we're in the middle of a federal election campaign right now have you heard anything from any of the parties that you think speaks to any of what we're talking about here tonight? No. Does that surprise you? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> but it saddens you, I bet. I think that it's um, unfortunate for the whole country, in fact. What do you want to hear? I'd like to hear that Canadians, uh, people in Ontario specifically, are concerned about education for Aboriginal children and for people who are going to post-secondary. I think it's really important that Ontario begins to see the Aboriginal population as part of Ontario. That we're not merely relegated to certain categories of land, for example, or that we're not part of the um, larger um, community. I think it's really important that non-Aboriginal people learn about Aboriginal issues and Aboriginal education as well. It's important that non-Aboriginal people, Canadians, learn about our mutual history what we have in common. Yeah. It's important that Canadians understand that they're part of this larger context in which we're talking not only about education, but the ability to govern ourselves and to work on all of our issues collectively. Don, I don't want to take pot shots where they don't belong, but, but I, I want to criticize where appropriate. How seized with this issue do you think our federal and provincial governments are? Not at all, but my thought to that is the people who do the research for our political parties have not looked at those charts you saw on the population. I mean, here we are in a situation where there could be razor thin margins between the outcomes from the parties and they're all going after certain groups. Why are they not? I mean, if, even if they didn't get this consideration, this is the right thing to do and to make up for past errors, uh, there's a big population here that can vote for you or not vote for you. I, I just want to give you one example that Mimi thought about. It, it's not just about teaching your Aboriginal students. For example, 400,000 Aboriginal people in Canada were subjected to residential schools. Mm -hmm. You know that's hardly taught in any school curriculum across Canada. Hmm. If you did a survey amongst 20-year-olds in Canada, you would find probably 10, 15 percent were even aware of it. And yet, when you look at some of the difficulty that young people are having right now with suicides and dropouts, you go back and what happened to their parents and what happened to their grandparents. They never had parents. They became parents, they had no experience, and it's gone through the generation. So you would look at that as an uninformed person and draw certain conclusions but you don't know what the background is. How can we, how can we, we talk about travesties in other countries, we don't even talk about the one that happened here. Gary, in our last 30 seconds, let, let me try this. Uh, I asked Sean Atlio early in the program, you know, why don't you get out there and make sure that people vote? And he said, well, I really can't do that. You know, uh, you know some people, some Aboriginals will vote, uh, Aboriginal Canadians, excuse me, will vote, and some won't, and I'm not pressuring them one way or another. How about you? Um, well, it becomes a, a bit of a, uh, a delicate balance in the sense that uh, you know whoever forms government you have to work with them uh, but what I encourage our people to do uh, all Aboriginal people is to look at look at what the parties are offering and look at what they've done um, and uh, and you know go on an informed decision and, and vote we absolutely encourage people to vote look at a track record look at what have they done to to address these issues issues that are important to you and look at what their policy is going forward will you endorse anybody in this campaign uh, we, we're going to be sending out communications to all parties to actually see what is in their platforms f for uh, Métis-specific and obviously Aboriginal issues 
and then we're going to communicate that absolutely with our citizens. Great. I want to thank everybody for coming in and helping us up with this discussion here today. Gary Lipinski and Mimi Gelman, uh, the president of the Métis Nation of Ontario and the PhD candidate from Queen's University, respectively. Don Drummond, the former chief economist of the TD Bank, now at Queen's University. Brenda Small, the dean of the Naganiwin College of Academic and Community Development up in Thunder Bay, within Confederation of College, of course. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dean.